Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'd actually forgotten how much I like DC. And I think I'm here after about eight years this time. So it's really wonderful to be back. Thank you. Um, the title of my presentation today is Renewable Inequity, Inequity, Women's Employment in Clean Energy in Industrialized, Emerging and Developing Countries. I know it's a bit of a handful, um, but you know, sometimes I try to be clever, sometimes I try to be both clever and descriptive. I guess this one is one of those. Um, so to start off, concerns about environmental sustainability and fossil fuel insecurity have convinced many countries as you know, to transition to low carbon energy supplies derived from renewables such as solar, hydro, bioenergy and wind. Since producing and distributing renewables is more labor intensive than producing and distributing fossil fuels, this shift is creating new employment opportunities and also addressing energy poverty in remote as well as underserved communities around the world. So renewable energy employed about 7.7 .7 million people, either directly or indirectly, around the world in the year 2014. And this is the number that excludes large hydropower. So there are definitional issues as well with what comprises renewable and obviously what comprises clean energy. Um, this is an 18% increase from the previous year, and employment in this sector is expected to continue growing in the future. Despite this kind of global enthusiasm for renewables, when I actually apply a gender lens to renewables, there are at least two major blind spots that come up right away. First, women are known to have weak access to technologies, to new technologies almost everywhere in the world. So there are likely to be some unequal access issues inherent in this transition to low carbon energy. Second, it's well established not only that 70% of the world's poorest 1.3 billion people are women and children, but also that women are already actually very poorly represented globally in sectors such as construction, renewable energy, manufacturing, and public transportation that are quite critical to sort of what we're increasingly calling the low carbon development field. And these are sectors that are scheduled to grow quite dramatically in the next few decades. Women constitute less than 6% of technical staff and below 1% of top managers in the fossil fuel based energy sector. And the best estimates I have for renewable energy is from the International Renewable Energy Agency. And they think women make up very optimistically about 20% of the global renewable energy workforce. So in the absence of very proactively and appropriately targeted training, education, apprenticeships, employment placement, financial tools, and supportive social policies, transitioning to renewables may actually exacerbate existing gender inequities and they may also hinder broader human development goals that we really care about. Actually, let me. So I've conducted quite extensive um, comparative research and knowledge synthesis of women's employment in renewable energy in OECD countries. I've looked at US, Canada, Spain, Germany, and Italy. Emerging economies, I've looked at Brazil, Russia, India, and China. I've also done primary research in India on the topic. So I wasn't sure, actually, when I was looking at WRI's website, I spent quite a bit of time looking at it, and I wasn't sure how much WRI's work had focused on gender equity and energy access and employment. So I set myself what I think is perhaps, I mean, it's definitely an ambitious goal and perhaps a little too ambitious, we'll find out. Um, so what I'll do is talk today about two different things. I'll talk first about sort of occupational patterns in women's employment. And I'll talk about everything, as all the data I have in a sense. I'll talk about industrialized countries, emerging economies, and other developing countries. Um, and also talk about similarities and differences in the challenges and opportunities that women face in seeking employment in renewable energy in different parts of the world. Some of my findings are quite counterintuitive, so I think they make for an interesting discussion. Certainly very happy to answer questions. Um, because jobs in the renewable energy sector tend to be dispersed across many different sectors of employment, so you know, construction, manufacturing, operations, and maintenance, for example, specific information related to the clean energy sector is actually seldom captured in national statistics. So sex disaggregated data on employ employment and renewables is even harder to find. That has, that's been one of the biggest challenges of doing this work. This made it very difficult for me to avoid relying on data sometimes on broader categories. So I looked, for example, at clean jobs. I looked at green jobs, clean jobs, as well as related science, technology, engineering, and math, so what's called STEM fields, uh, in order just to be able to do this research. But what I did find was that when I complemented this existing data from OECD countries, 
from emerging economies and from other developing nations, I found a range of previously undocumented challenges and opportunities faced by women in the renewable energy sector. So when we look, for example, at OECD countries to begin with, uh, sex disaggregated data, even in industrialized countries as well, is very scarce. But the numbers that I'm able to put together point to very severe underrepresentation of women. In OECD countries, women hold a minority of jobs in general in the energy field. Um, the available data from Canada, the countries I have listed up there, indicates a general trend of women um, in, this, in renewable energy being employed mostly in non-technical occupations. So I'm finding the greatest representation of women in the renewable energy employment in, in OECD countries is in, the, is in sales, primarily, that's the big one. Sales, followed by administrative positions, and then engineers and technicians. In absolute numbers, the largest numbers of renewable, the largest sources of renewable energy employment for women in industrialized countries are, I found a lot of employment in solar, in solar, solar photovoltaics, solar heating and cooling, wind power, biomass, and biofuels. Now, the underrepresentation of women in renewable energy employment in many OECD countries is part of a much bigger problem of the underrepresentation of women in STEM fields more broadly. There's an obvious economic benefit for women who choose to pursue these paths, while wage inequality also exists in STEM jobs. That's the bad news. There's good news in that it's a smaller wage gap relative to men. So women in STEM fields typically earn 33% more than women in non-STEM occupations. And the gender gap in uh, STEM jobs is roughly 14%, whereas in non-STEM jobs, it's about 21%. So it's one of those glass half empty, glass half full type of um, situations. Um, now moving on to looking at emerging economies um, and developing countries, uh, renewable energy deployment continues to grow uh, sort of globally as a sustainable and increasingly economically viable alternative to conventional sources of energy. Between 2009 and 2015, the prices have dropped of renewable energy technologies have dropped about 70%. So it's pretty steep, it's quite dramatic. Um, there's also growing recognition of the positive social and economic benefits of a renewable energy deployment. The employment effects of renewable energy investment in particular are increasingly gaining prominence in this debate, in the global en uh, renewable energy debate, but very specific analytical work and empirical evidence on this topic remains quite limited. And even general employment data on renewable energy is unavailable or either unavailable or unreliable in many settings. And sex disaggregated data on employment in renewables is particularly spotty everywhere in the world. So this makes analyzing trends and making comparisons quite challenging. But estimates on women's employment in renewables can also differ quite dramatically depending on whether the analysis includes or excludes, for example, large hydro, large hydropower, as well as informal employment in renewable energy. So particularly in things like traditional biomass and fuel crop production. There are no national data sets that can tell us the exact or even the approximate numbers of women who are employed in informal jobs in activities such as fuel wood collection, for example, and charcoal production. So by no means clean energy, but definitely renewable sources of energy. And extrapolations from regional data sets suggest that the numbers are really quite significant. For example, I found that up to 13 million people may be employed in commercial biomass in sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, fuel wood and charcoal represent between 50 to 90 percent of all energy needs in developing countries and 60 to 80 percent of total wood consumption. Since women are largely responsible for procuring firewood for household needs, it's reasonable to expect that millions of women are engaged either formally or informally in the biomass sector. More broadly speaking, it's quite well established that women represent about 50% of the agricultural workforce in Sub-Saharan Africa. So given the similarities in the nature of activities, it's reasonable to infer that women's participation in commercial biomass is actually also quite significant. Production of, uh, of uh, biofuels, so I have of uh, fuel crops, Jatropha for example, is, a source of formal, uh, is an important source of both formal and informal renewable energy employment in developing countries. Farming communities in the developing world have always known how to use oil seeds, for example, for lighting purposes. Jatropha, for example, is increasingly integrated into farm production systems in India, in Cambodia, and in Mexico as a complement rather than as a substitute for food crops. 
So I looked at a lot of these community biofuel projects um, carried out by the, it's the International Network on Energy and Gender, Energia, in 2009. And I looked and I found that village level production of biofuels can actually be quite economically sustainable. It can create employment and improve energy access in many underserved rural and remote communities. Such systems can reduce the drudgery of fuel collection for women and also improve their participation in community affairs and decision making. Um, the Energia report, I remember, does, rem does actually warn about the danger of shifting from integrated fuel and food crop production to monocropping for commercial production, as this may result in a loss of land, income, and food security. I'm sure that many of you are kind of familiar increasingly with this sort of the food versus fuel type, um, type debate. And biofuels have generally commanded a lot of attention in research and policy circles in recent years as a source of renewable energy that can provide energy security, you know, create sustainable livelihoods, mitigate climate change, and foster international trade, there are simultaneously really serious concerns that diverting land from biofuel production may compromise food security and health for poor and vulnerable people. There's definitely more research that needs to be done on this topic, and I'm trying to collaborate with a series of uh, the Indian Institutes of Technology, the IITs in India, to try and understand sort of the opportunities, uh, opportunities and the constraints in terms of fuel, uh, fuel wood, sort of uh, biofuel production, and trying to understand it from a gender equity and a broadly a social justice perspective. So I'll report back in the future on that. Um, we do have a better sense of the numbers of women who hold formal jobs or earn commissions in developing countries and in emerging economies from activities such as manufacturing, constructing, operating, maintaining, and selling, for example, solar lights and solar cook stoves. Uh, because these initiatives typically tend to be driven by governments, by NGOs, by private sector organizations, and social enterprises. I've done quite a bit on this. I won't be talking about it in as much detail in this presentation, but I looked at two very big um, sort of renewable energy uh, projects in India. One is called Lighting a Billion Lives, and it's a project run by the Energy and Resources Institute in India. And the other is called the Hariali Green Energy Project. And that's a project that's financed by IFC, the National Finance Corporation, but it's run by the Self-Employed Women's Association. There's quite a bit on the, in it on the types of employment that can be generated with the use of renewable energies. So moving on, I'm going to talk actually for pretty much for the rest of my presentation. I think I'll try and focus on some of the challenges and opportunities um, for women's employment in sort of globally and try and look at some comparative um, trends. Women's participation in the formal labor market has historically and at the present time been determined by a combination of things. So a combination of social norms, cultural attitudes, societal values, and economic necessity. But women's roles and responsibilities were traditionally geared towards household duties and towards unpaid labor in many parts of the world. At the same time, gender roles tend to be extremely malleable. And social norms are changing, I find, all over the world quite dramatically. Women were economically active even when they were confined to the private sphere. But they are also participating both out of choice and out of necessity in the formal labor force in pretty unprecedented numbers at the present time. A review of the literature um, and my own empirical work revealed the following factors as constraints and opportunities for women's meaningful participation in renewable energy sectors. And this is true for you know, different trends, but then the factors themselves, I think, apply to many different world contexts. What is important, I think, is to emphasize that sometimes the line between an opportunity and a constraint can be quite fuzzy, because some constraints can potentially become opportunities if we have appropriate, say, policy interventions, as well as shifts in social attitudes. So I think it's kind of important to think that some of these opportunities are actually challenges, and some of the challenges are actually opportunities. The first one I call misperceptions. Um, and I think it's a combination of women's self-perceptions as well as societal perceptions of women's incompetence in technical occupations. That's been identified quite frequently in the literature as an impediment for women's optimal participation. I'm sure this isn't surprising to anyone. We've all heard of the mythologies of women not knowing how to use, basically, technology. What did surprise me, though, is that women may actually be discouraged from entering occupations in renewable energy and more broadly in engineering fields and technology fields because of the misperceptions of the work involved in these fields. Because the technological aspects of these occupations 
get so much attention, women are often led to believe that they are not particularly socially useful. The message that these occupations can improve lives is often overshadowed by the technical aspects of building things. This may explain, at least in part, I think, why women are a significant presence and of often even the majority in medical and biological sciences for ex as well as in certain engineering disciplines. So for example, biosystems engineering, environmental engineering, and chemical engineering, in which they can clearly see how their work makes a difference. But they tend to be less well represented in fields like civil, electronics, and computer engineering that are perceived as more technically focused and socially isolating. And again, I'm cautious about making generalizations here because there's nothing that says that all women want jobs that are not socially isolating, right? So we have to be careful about this. But the result is that often women may end up attributing lower status sometimes to energy and technology occupations compared with, for example, health and social sciences. So the professional community of engineers, and I think this particularly applies to OECD countries, does not appear to have done well at leveraging the message that engineering is both prestigious as well as socially useful work. By contrast, much larger numbers of middle class women study engineering and other technical fields in some developing countries and some emerging economies, at least partially because they are perceived as very well paid as well as high status occupations. And I'll talk about this a bit more in this presentation. I also looked at the potential for women's employment in, through self-employment self and entrepreneurship in renewable energy. And I found that issues of self and societal perceptions may be less of a constraint when women own enterprises or if they are self-employed. Provided that there is adequate business training, financial support, and social safety nets in place, women seem to do quite well with self-employment. Women are establishing new energy enterprises, both in industrialized countries and in emerging economies. So for example, an organization in Canada called WIRE, Women in Renewable Energy, um, they revealed to me that of their membership base of about 1,000 women in the province of Ontario, at least 20% were doing something entrepreneurial in, in renewable energy. Uh, I, don't, I don't know more than that, but they were very clear that it was about 20% of their membership base. Women are also very well represented in activities like manufacturing, stocking, selling of improved cook stoves, in, both, in sales basically, in both Asia and Africa. Of course, when you think about gender inequality as sort of a structural issue, as it is and I think it should be, it's very difficult not to feel intellectually uncomfortable with this very instrumental and stereotypical deployment of women in marketing and dissemination initiatives for improved cook stoves. And, you know, I work with a lot of these organizations and I appreciate the work they do, but I'm always troubled when they say, oh, but it's just natural that women are selling cook stoves. Because it's natural that women cook. So I'm always uncomfortable about that. At the same time, I think it's really important to recognize the creation of better paid and less menial livelihoods for poor women. So you know, keep both in mind in a sense. I think it's also it's important to provide the right type of support for women's entrepreneurial abilities, but it's also important to be cognizant that entrepreneurship is often not a realistic livelihood strategy for some, particularly low-income women, and even very well-intentioned and progressive interventions by governments, by social enterprises, by civil society organizations, fail to level the playing field for them. And I've, I found this repeatedly in my projects, that they were very well-intentioned projects, but they just don't level the playing field, especially for the poorest women. Low-income women, and this is true for both industrialized and sort of developing economies, do not become entrepreneurs because the burden of entrepreneurship and the risk associated with the loans often is simply too high for them. So I found that poorer women everywhere in the world tend to be much more interested in very stable wage employment than they are in entrepreneurship. And research in various locations in, around the world, I've looked at developing countries, emerging economies, countries that were formerly part of the Soviet Union. It has shown that microcredit, for example, is not an appropriate tool to support the development of small and medium enterprises. More specifically, my research in India very clearly found that, especially in the absence of subsidies, the higher cost of renewable energy technologies makes microcredit loans an inadequate tool for enterprise development in renewables. Most poor women in developing countries are interested in the energy sector because of the potential for income generation, but they are also extremely averse to financial risk, understandably, I think. Um, they're much more likely to pursue opportunities in the energy sector if they can earn incomes without becoming indebted. So acquiring new skills, such as learning to build and repair technologies, may be much better suited for their 
economic realities and limitations. I think about organizations like SEWA, the Self-Employed Women's Association. I think about Grameen Shakti in Bangladesh. They're actively trying to meet these needs through various solar and biomass initiatives. But the problem there is that the creation of permanent and stable sources of income still remains a challenge. In addition to construction, installation, and repair, there are other opportunities for low-income women to earn livelihoods in the renewable energy sector. These activities include things like educating people about the health risks of smoke inhalation um, and the environmental dangers of emissions, creating awareness about the benefits of using renewable energy technologies, conducting energy audits of homes and businesses to demonstrate opportunities for reducing energy consumption and waste, and also connecting potential customers of green technologies with financing opportunities that are available through banks and NGOs. Do you have a question? Have a yeah. Question. You might get to this later, but do you have a sense of what the breakdown is and the size of jobs in the renewable energy sector? So you talked a little bit about, at the beginning about the importance of STEM or not STEM. So do you know how many of these are sort of college level jobs versus... Okay. STEM? I do talk about okay. them a fair bit later, so happy to, yeah, happy to provide more about that. The number of organizations generally working in the, in the energy sector is still quite small, so there is room for more innovation in this sector for the creation of sort of all kinds of things, training, apprenticeships, and employment opportunities. But I think it's very important to be cognizant, though, that women who are employed in various activities in the energy sector, so whether it's manufacturing, installation, repair, dissemination, awareness generation, marketing, I find that they continue to face challenges of finding kind of more permanent employment with their newly acquired, or rather more reliable employment, let's put it that way, with their newly acquired skills, as they are often only able to earn incomes on kind of an irregular and intermittent basis through contracts and orders placed by social enterprises, nonprofits, and government agencies. This shortcoming I found is common to most livelihoods in the renewable energy sector in developing countries. It highlights the need, I think, for governments to provide adequate social security to protect against kind of vagaries in the market, natural disasters, illness, maternity, old age, job losses, and other risks to people's well-being. I'll take it even further than that and say that I think providing social protection within a human rights framework and delinking social protection from employment status is a strategy that I think is worth pursuing worldwide. Um, it's not going to happen under a Trump presidency, that's for sure. Sorry. <laughs> women can gain, uh, women can gain um, optimal traction from renewable energy initiatives only if there are wider socially progressive policies in place. And since women's ability to take advantage of new energy-related employment options is to begin with often constrained by legal and or social barriers that limit their education, their property rights, land tenure, and access to credit, I think it's very crucial that we go beyond just energy sector planning to optimize opportunities for women. I also looked at work in terms of full-time work, part-time work, and job sharing. What do these things hold? And is there any potential for these things to actually play a role in improving women's access to employment? Um, the country that I found most interesting was Spain. I looked at Spain and I found that only two jobs, only 2% of jobs in renewable energy in Spain are part-time, but women hold 67% of those jobs. So part-time jobs, you know, 67% are held by women in the renewable energy sector. It's important to remember though that part-time jobs are not necessarily bad jobs. I think it's really important. Some recent research suggests that creating more part-time jobs and arrangements like work sharing, provided they have job security, as well as health and pension benefits, may actually be a pretty feasible way of restructuring work in the future, while in a way balancing economic security, environmental sustainability, as well as gender equity in, some, in all sectors of the economy. At the same time, since overproduction and overconsumption, particularly by the wealthy, I think in all global settings, remains the biggest impediment to environmental sustainability, transitioning to clean energy sources or to a green economy more broadly is not going to be enough in and of itself to prevent climate change and to address other environmental problems. However, some recent research actually suggests that we can restructure work in interesting ways, in innovative ways, while expanding social security nets. And this may present some solutions for this kind of um, energy economy, social justice type trilemma. 
Work reduction has not been very prevalent in North America, but it's been pursued with limited success in some European countries. Unions in France, for example, recently fought for a 35-hour work week. I think many of you may have seen this on Facebook. It came around quite a bit. Um, unions in the Netherlands have played a pivotal role in creating quality part-time jobs. And unlike in North America, when as soon as you hear part-time jobs, a part-time job, it sounds like a bad job right away. Poor benefits, poor wages. Unlike in North America, these part-time jobs are actually quite good jobs. They have roughly the same hourly pay as full-time work and similar benefits and security. The average American works about 1,900 hours per year, while the average Dutch person works, I think, about 1,350, so about uh, 1,350 hours per year, so about 30% less. Um, they're all moving. <laughs> so while I agree, while I agree with the potential for part-time work and job sharing to promote economic security and environmental sustainability, I'm actually quite ambivalent about the assertion that creating more part-time jobs for all will lead to a more equitable division, for example, of household labor between women and men. Um, this assumption is based on the fact that women do a disproportionate amount of household work and caregiving work everywhere in the world while also working outside the home, almost as much as men today. But they are not, they have as much as men who have not reciprocated in a commensurate way in sharing caregiving work. So the idea that larger numbers of men will spend more time on caregiving if they have to work less or if they have access to flexible uh, working schedules is hopeful, but it hasn't actually been supported with much empirical evidence. Countries with the most equitable gender norms do tend to have a better established tradition of flex time policies, so perhaps there's reason for optimism. In the US, for example, only 27% of firms offer more than 50% of their employees flex time. By contrast, 68% of Swedish workplaces offer flex time to 80% of, empl of employees. Even if such policies were in place in more countries, we would still be left with the more significant challenge of changing the perception of caregiving as a deeply satisfying and important aspect of human existence rather than as a burden, which is how it's often described um, in, 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 in actually a lot of different circles. Governments can certainly play a role in enabling such a shift by instituting things like annual income, uh, you know, living wage regulations, by changing labor laws, perhaps including maximum hours and minimum wage regulations, and by ensuring that part-time work is good work with prohibitions against lower pay and, f and fewer benefits. However, the deeper political and social consciousness that is required for a transformation of intra-household gender division of labor would have to be enabled informally and socially, perhaps through collective action, but not through legal sanctions or other government actions. Policy by itself cannot make men want to spend more time caregiving if care work continues to be perceived as low status feminized work, and neither can policy require women to give up control over care, particularly over the raising of children, if they've been socialized to believe that women are their primary responsibility. So until more transformative social change takes place in gender relations, I think flexible working schedules may actually have the opposite effect. I think they may reinforce existing gender inequities in employment and care. And people who are the biggest proponents, um, I think of Jennifer Nadelsky at University of Toronto, she acknowledges this possibility even while sort of endorsing the idea and the possibility of part-time work for all. The other thing that I think about a lot is if we, in the future, if we have more of these types of job sharing and part-time work type arrangements, what will happen to workers' unions? Will they remain relevant if part-time jobs become more of a norm? Or will we see new modes of organizing, mobilizing, and perhaps collective bargaining in the future? These are, I think, important questions to ask. I mean, of course, unions are generally much stronger in European countries, especially Scandinavian countries, and even in Canada and UK than they are in the US. Um, regardless of what form representative organizations take in the future, I do think that promoting gender equity must remain a core principle. Countries that tend to have the highest union densities, so countries like Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, and France, also have very strong feminist movements and feminist contingents within the big unions. These movements have managed to rearticulate what contemporary unions should be, and they brought back to prominence some of the union movement's original causes, as well as broader societal questions about the importance of delinking social entitlements from employment status. I think other OECD countries um, and emerging economies that do not have strong feminist contingents within unions might benefit from, from such organizing and strategizing. Having said that, I have to say that the level of unionization in new green jobs, so to speak, tends to be very low everywhere in the world. 
So I looked at that and I found it to be really quite low almost everywhere in the world. So whether or not new or configured, sort of reconfigured modes of organizing collective bargaining and, and you know, um, mobilizing will emerge in the future, at this point it's really just a matter of conjecture. I don't know what will happen with that. The other factor that came up again and again in my research was the issue of kind of travel and mobility for women who do work in the renewable energy sector. So much like jobs in the conventional fossil fuel industry, employment in the renewable energy sector can require significant travel and time away from home. This can be challenging for men too, of course, but women with caregiving uh, responsibilities may be put at a particular disadvantage. Um, the locations of large renewable energy construction projects are determined in part by the geography of natural resources and are often in quite isolated areas with no provisions for the families of workers, for example. Although such factors may explain women's underrepresentation in the energy sector, to some extent, I think, uh, many work, women may already be working in less than optimal environments for much less pay than they would make in the energy sector. And given the option, would probably prefer to work in the energy sector for higher wages. So to me, it doesn't explain all of it. I also think that because of a very entrenched masculinist hiring norms and institutional cultures within the traditional energy sector, uh, women are frequently not given the option to choose between undesirable working conditions with low pay and similar conditions with higher pay. Right. So what I'm seeing a lot of is that the, the workforce is really transitioning in many cases from fossil fuels into renewable energy. Um, and if we don't pay attention to equity issues, it'll just reproduce itself in the renewable energy sector. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy and we're already seeing it happening in many places in the world. Women in developing countries may also face mobility constraints owing to social responsibilities and the traditional division of labor. But they are also much more likely to live in extended joint and intergenerational family setups where grandparents, for example, live with married uh, children and grandchildren. This can be very helpful for women in occupations that require extensive travel and time away from home. I've collaborated quite frequently with uh, middle class women in, in professional women in India, for example, women working for the Energy and Resources Institute, women working for a variety of nonprofits, um, research organizations. And I was always quite, and these are all women with fairly small children, and I was always quite surprised that they travel internationally, often on a far more frequent basis than most professional women in North America and Europe. And when I looked into it, you know, I realized that they were able to do this precisely because they live in very traditional joint family settings where their grandparents, for example, are always available to take care of children. The available availability of affordable live-in caregivers also gives middle class professional women in many developing countries a mobility advantage that most of their counterparts, ironically, in, industrial country, in industrialized countries cannot afford. So although the gender division of intra-household re labor remains intact in everywhere in the world, I think, in the sense, in as much as it's still women doing the caregiving, middle class women in some settings in the global south often have a comparative career advantage due to these factors. Um, since there is often also a much stronger sense of collective and social parenting in many non-Western settings, women are also, I think, judged far less harshly, if at all, for leaving their children with other family members or caregivers in order to go to work. Uh, I travel a lot for work and my husband takes care of my child and I'm obviously takes care of our child, but um, I'm amazed at the number of times people will comment on that, like, where did you leave your child? And I always say, well, I'm tempted at this point to say I leave him outside Toronto airport <laughs> with $50 and a credit card. I mean, he's five years old, so if he's a teenager, he'd probably like that arrangement. So I just think, what do you mean, where did I leave my child? Obviously his dad is taking care of him. But I find that that actually happens more, I think, in many cases here than it does, because I don't hear women say, uh, I've collaborated with, with Chinese women, with professional women, with Indian women, and they say no, because there isn't, there isn't as strong an understanding that children have to be raised by within that nuclear family unit. Right? So it's completely acceptable that there are other people raising your children in that sense or taking care of them. Uh, so that was kind of an interesting thing and I think there are other people who've looked into this. Uh, there was a great New York Times female factor series. Um, it's called the female factor series. It looks at the status of women in many parts of the world. And I remember one of them talked about how why are women so scarce 
among top bankers in New York and in London, and Toronto for that matter, despite decades of struggle to climb the corporate ladder? And how is it that they hold some of the most prestigious portfolios in India's relatively young financial industry? And something like the 50% of the board of governors of the Reserve Bank of India are women. And I think a lot of it was attributed to those factors of extended family support uh, within these cultures. Um, the other point that I, the other big finding was of course really important. I found that broadly speaking, women in engineering in OECD countries, the numbers are low to begin with and they've actually, despite many efforts, been declining in many industrialized countries. Um, of course, there are skill shortages in renewable energy sector also in developing countries, huge skill shortages, especially among women. There is also often a lack of technical and business skills required for employment and for enterprise development in renewables. So you have low levels of literacy, limited access to basic education that makes such skills particularly challenging for poor and for rural women to acquire. So organizations like, I looked at the Indira Gandhi National Open University in India, Solar Sister, which has operations in many African countries, Grameen Shakti, the Barefoot College in India, Innovation Center for the Poor, the Self-Employed Women's Association, they provide, they've been trying to provide customized solutions for training for individual women and sort of some of these opportunities for, for example, cross-mentoring um, um, among local entrepreneurs, for example, and attempting to close some of these gaps that I think are quite significant. Um, unlike North America and Europe, though, where women remain a minority in engineering programs, Comparatively much larger numbers of middle class women in some emerging economies, India and China are two good examples, study engineering. So although women may do continue to experience glass ceilings and employment discrimination in various forms, even in, in, in all countries for sure, recruitment particularly for entry level positions is not a challenge in some countries because of the very large numbers of women who are earning engineering degrees. So in China, for example, 40% of engineers are women. Um, in India, I found 37% of electronics engineers are women. Uh, the numbers for civil engineering, computer engineering, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering are 20%, 18%, 17%, and 10%. So not fantastic, but not dismal either. Pretty good, um, pretty good numbers. In the 1980s, 58% of engineers in the USSR were women. But a well-established tradition of state-enforced gender diversity disintegrated in the, in the 1990s and the 2000s with the collapse of the USSR and its industrial model. In 1998, women accounted for 43.3% of engineers in Russia. In 2002, that number had declined to 40.9%, and the numbers have continued to decline further. The Baltic countries, those I found very interesting, so Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, that were formerly part of the USSR, but that joined the EU much earlier in the 1990s, revealed similar patterns of comparably high but declining rates of participation by women in engineering and technology fields. The World Economic Forum reports that in Estonia, for example, female professional and technical workers still outnumber men by actually two to one, actually even more than two to one, 68% women compared to 32% men. Estonia offers significant tuition incentives to draw high school students into fields such as engineering, and they continue to be identified by the World Economic Forum as the country with the highest per capita number of female engineers, even as the numbers of women joining the field have actually declined in the past few, in the past few decades. Although, I mean, the point of this is not obviously to be advocating a return to Soviet-style central planning, just to be clear about that. I think it's important to emphasize, though, that state initiatives aimed at improving representation and removing barriers for career advancement for women in engineering as well as in other fields, they do work and they can benefit the, reliable, the renewable energy sector and they can benefit the renewable energy sector, I think, pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, and that's what I'll turn to finally, is the, a little bit about the, uh, the role of the public sector. Generally speaking, I found that the renewable energy workforce globally represented a vertically and a horizontally gender stratified labor market. Women concentrated in the lowest paid positions, typically closest to the most menial and tedious components, and furthest from the creative design of technology and the authority of management or policy making. However, there are some qualitative differences in women's employment in renewables in, the, in developing countries and emerging economies 
in different parts of the world rather, that needs to be fleshed out further. Much of the expansion of renewables in developing countries and emerging economies has occurred because large numbers of rural, urban poor and remote communities either have no access to the grid or they have unreliable or inadequate access to electricity for lighting, heating, cooling and heating purposes. For lighting, heating, um, cooling purposes rather. A large volume of employment has been generated for mo both men and women in these contexts because organizations serving such communities so for example, Solar Sister, like I mentioned, Barefoot College, Charmontas, which is another one in Bangladesh, have actively sought to use renewable energy uh, technologies to also secure and improve livelihoods. So they, they made a very good connection between access and livelihoods. Um, such off-grid decentralized renewable energy initiatives have offered women a much larger volume of employment, albeit very poorly compensated and insecure employment, as well as opportunities to participate in decision making. This is because these initiatives are deployed at the local level, where women are more likely to be involved in the procurement, design, installation, operation, and maintenance of energy. Decision making within bigger utility systems, so when we look at energy utilities, for example, in both the global north and south, are on the other hand made by much higher level professional staff within the spheres of generation, transmission, and distribution, where women are almost always quite severely underrepresented. The importance of public sector involvement in creating a policy framework to enable the sustainable development and dissemination of renewables, as well as to ensure employment equity, has been made, I think, everywhere in the world. Um, the 10 countries today with the largest renewable energy employment in 2014 were China, Brazil, the US, India, Germany, Indonesia, Japan, France, Bangladesh, and Colombia. These countries have become major manufacturers of en uh, renewable energy equipment, producers of bioenergy, um, feedstock and installers of production capacity, so just a range of different things. An array of industrial and trade policies continue to shape employment with predictable and stable government interventions favoring job creation. Although governments in these countries may not be directly involved often in developing and disseminating renewables, They've put incentives and subsidy structures in place that direct even private investment to areas that would otherwise not be prioritized. However, many of these countries have not introduced any meaningful policies to promote employment equity in the renewable energy sector. So policy intervention aimed at gender equity in employment is, I think, the most important uh, prerequisite for optimizing women's participation and employment in renewables and in STEM, in STEM fields more broadly. Brazil is a good example, I think, of a renewable, of an emerging economy in which women's participation in STEM fields, in science, technology, as well as in innovation, has risen quite dramatically in recent years. And this has been due to substantial investment and progressive social policies that include things like state-funded tuition. Brazil is the largest national investor in science and technology in Latin America and the Caribbean at about 1.4% of its GDP, so very high. And Brazil in particular is particularly notable for the prominent role played by women in education and in research. The availability and the transparency of things like scholarship awards, particularly at the graduate level in science and technology, have really aided women's substantial participation. Broadly speaking though, I think that equity and access policies that are adopted to promote gender equality are often very linear and positivist, pretty much everywhere in the world. They don't seek any special privileges for women, and they simply demand that everyone receive consideration without discrimination on the basis of sex. They're quite inadequate because they fail to address the wide range of social and institutional factors that prevent women from succeeding, and also because they don't actually demand preferential pro-women hiring practices to correct historical and current injustices and inequalities. However, I would argue that even such, of such simplistic, often liberal policies can improve women's access to, uh, to opportunities in sectors, typically, for example, like energy, both traditional as well as renewable, that are almost completely male dominated. More comprehensive and finely tuned policies that take structural constraints into consideration will optimize women's performance and advancement in the renewable energy sector. Government spending through stimulus packages and public procurement can also address gender inequality. Contractors for public agencies, for example, can be required to adopt affirmative action goals to correct the underrepresentation of women in their workforces. Green stimulus spending should come with conditional requirements for the recruitment and retention of women. Although countries like Canada, US, Australia, France, and UK 
earmarked significant stimulus funding in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis for green initiatives, very little, if any, funds were allocated for the integration of women into green occupations. The U.S. did allocate some minor funds. Out of the $27 billion in total, in total that was allocated for energy efficiency and renewable energy research and investments for training women in, for green occupations in the American Recovery and Investment Act of 2009. And even this very minor injection of funds resulted in several short-term pilot initiatives to demonstrate the potential for women in high-growth green occupations. But despite the constant lip service that is being paid to the importance of green jobs in industrialized economies, even boutique initiatives of the kind enabled by the stimulus spending in the U.S. are actually very hard to find in many other OECD countries, including in Canada, where I can't find any. So I'll conclude by saying that there are similarities and differences between industrialized economies and emerging economies in the patterns of women's employment in the renewable energy sector. A much larger volume of employment has been generated for women in developing countries and emerging economies through off-grid decentralized renewable energy initiatives that also address energy poverty in remote or underserved communities. There's tremendous potential to create livelihoods for women in the renewable energy sector. However, women can gain optimal traction from renewable energy initiatives only within the context of wider socially progressive sort of policies and more transformative shifts as well in societal attitudes about gender roles. And this I found to be as true for developing countries as it is for OECD countries or emerging economies. It's today become a bit of standard practice, I think, within international development circles to emphasize economic opportunities for women as a means to broader objectives such as poverty reduction and environmental protection. This is evidently, you know, self-evidently justified since women make up 50% of the world's population. However, the logic for empowering women is often based on very essentialist assumptions about things like women's empathy for nature and their tendency to spend most of their incomes on, their, on the collective needs of the family and on equally problematic assumptions about men's need, for example, for things like dominating nature as well as their tendency to spend more on themselves and less on their families. And I think many scholars and practitioners have criticized such assumptions because they really reinforce and perpetuate what I think are grossly unjustifiable and really simplistic stereotypes about quote unquote third world men and women. Poor women and men support themselves and their families as well as they can with the means available to them. We should not focus on creating quality employment opportunities for women because they are more benevolent than men or because they're better capable of taking care of their children. The growth of the renewable energy sector should benefit both women and men, but we must be proactive about enabling women to establish a much stronger equity stake to compensate for historical and contemporary economic injustices and unequal outcomes. This will require more concrete and proactive actions and policies, simply creating opportunities for training and employment in new fields and suggesting that women are not unwelcome in them is obviously not enough. In addition to increasing women's participation in male-dominated occupations that are well-respected and well-compensated, uh, we should be very concerned about how undervalued and underpaid women are in sectors like early childhood education, primary education, social work, health and library services, in which they are already the majority. There's a great op-ed that Linda Hirschman did in uh, the New York Times where she wrote, maybe it would be a better world if more women became engineers and construction workers but programs encouraging women to pursue engineering have existed for decades without having much success. At the moment, teachers and childcare workers still need to support themselves. Many are their families as sole support. So improving the status, wages, and working conditions for people working in female-dominated sectors is as, if not more important, as increasing women's participation in well-compensated occupations that have historically been male-dominated. Male Thank you very much. Any questions? And those are some of the work we've put out in recent years. I'm part of this um, international research network called Climate Change, Gender, and Work in Rich Countries. Um, you know, UNSW in Australia has a Women in Renewable Energy Society. So there are these you know, things happening um, in bits and pieces everywhere. <laughs>
I tried to pack a lot into that. I thought I had, I thought it was an hour and a half. I was like, okay, an hour. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. It was a very rich talk. Um, I wanted to to push the, the uh, plumb your knowledge uh, in yeah. a deeper dive about the uh, potential for, for women in biomass. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that it seems that there is potential for women to get into this field because mm -hmm. they they are involved in agriculture. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering how much information there is about whether that really does happen, or is this one of those situations where the minute it becomes profitable and commercial, men suddenly yeah. become attracted to this field, yeah. just like you know, women cook, but, but, but men are chefs in restaurants. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, I, wish I, could, I wish I had a clear answer for you. One of the challenges of doing this research, honestly, has been that, that the, the data I find are in bits and pieces in many different places. Um, so what I do think, I agree with you, that there's a tendency to say, this is a great field, women should be working in it. And there's, so it's kind of like this wish list of things that women could be in. But when you actually go to find what's the empirical evidence of how it's working for women and whether or not it's working for them, there's very little, there's very little done on it. There's very little empirical work, which is why I was mentioning how we're starting this project. I'm hoping to start it with a couple of IITs in India, where we're going to look at biofuel because there's a national mission on biofuels in India. So it's, they're taking it up in a big way, trying to produce you know, uh, biofuels. And I want to see what's happening on the ground. Who are the farmers? How are they benefiting? You know, are there women farmers who are benefiting in it? Do they even have access to land title while doing it? So those are the things I really want answers to as well. So. Yeah. 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 In 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 when it comes to systems like you know the distributed like cook stoves or solar power, I do find that they do even mini grids. Some of them, I think there's more potential. But yeah, there's nothing that's that's saying that in the future that won't change if it becomes if the operations become perhaps more professionalized, right? So it's hard to tell. Yeah. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I, I have a que two questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one is, I, so if I understand, because you covered so much territory, I know. yeah. Um, <laughs> the central hypothesis, uh, and maybe I missed that in the beginning. So you're saying, you know, the that people are claiming renewal uh, as as we change the energy sector, yeah, and move yeah, from fossil yeah, to renewable. Yeah, there'll yeah. be a lot of jobs created, yeah, and it's job centric, yeah, etc. So that's yeah, one argument. Yeah. And you're saying that yes, that argument is true, but you know we might carry the same inequities that is there in the current sector to Absolutely. this new sector. Yeah. Is our people claiming, which I miss, that that green uh, economy will be more equitable economy, yeah. or so? Uh, so what no. is the argument? Okay. So the, yeah. Yeah. it seems from your presentation, the worst can happen is the same inequities yeah. that is there today yeah. mm -hmm. goes to the, the new economy, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Um, so we all want the same trans this transition yeah. Yeah. to take place. Yeah. And you also pointed out there are many other things which are societal that is embedded in this inequity. So yeah. I want to want to a little bit understand your perspective. What What is so special about the energy transition Okay. All right. To this issue, why is it not true for anything else? I mean, what is it that is peculiar here? That's one yeah. question. All right. okay. Would love because I didn't, I didn't yeah. get that. Okay. Yeah. The second is, you know, we all, not all, a lot of us in this room work on cities. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's our kind of this prism through which we look at this, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, the work that Michael is doing, that you're talking to him about, is we think. There's a lot of story to be told what happens in cities and Absolutely. energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we also think for a green economy change in cities, uh -huh. it's not just about energy. It's no. about how no. cities Absolutely are structured, yeah. how cities will be built, how mm -hmm. transportation will work. All those other ones are actually very centered around lower skilled jobs. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. I wonder if yeah. your views about that transition and how equitable that transition might be. First of all, I picked this field, I don't think not because it was there was anything particularly unique about it. It's just that the claims that are being made to me don't ma like the claims that are being made about job creation, but there's no conversation about equity in that field, right? So I got interested in it when I started realizing that they're talking about the volume of employment that will be generated, but people are asking fewer questions about what type of employment? I mean, if we have, if we create, if we move away from fossil fuels and 
There's this ad they use in Canada all the time where they tell you if you put in a million into fossil fuels, you get two jobs. If you put the same mil million into renewables, you get 15 jobs. And I say, great, but can I know a bit more about those 15 jobs? What kinds of jobs will they be? What kinds of wages will they play, pay? Will they be protected? Will there be social protections? Will there be benefits? And if not, if we're creating poorly paid precarious jobs in you know, the 15 jobs, then should we be getting that excited about the numbers? Right? So I started asking these questions and realizing that people weren't answering them to my satisfaction, that that conversation hadn't been had. Right? So I don't think there's anything unique. And I definitely don't think anybody is saying that the green economy is in and of itself going to create social transformation. How can it? All you'll do is just transfer all the problems, as you rightly mentioned, into the green. So I think unless, I think there is potential for social transformation, but that potential has to be very carefully planned, ex you know, carried out, and then monitored. That way it might, but if we don't even have the conversation about social equity, then it's already a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're already finding that the clean energy field is becoming dominated with the people who were, to begin with, quite dominant in the, you know, quote unquote, the brown economy. Right? So I don't think. No, 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 no. I really don't think it does. I think there's potential for it to be just, but that conversation isn't happening. Is more what I think it is. Yes. And I don't. And I completely agree with you. I think this is one piece. I looked when I started out. I looked more broadly at sort of the transition to low carbon development. And in that, I, there was a whole range of sectors. Energy is only one of them, right? So there's, for example, there is, you know, like cities, as you mentioned, retrofitting cities. How do you retrofit cities? How, how do we work with the cities we have instead of talking about, like, how do we plan new cities, right? So that's a big field. Uh, transportation is a huge one. You know, tourism is a huge one. Agriculture is a huge one. So this is just one subset that I took on, the energy field. So it's definitely not it's not, definitely not that I don't think the others are important. I think they're also equally important. What I will say is I'm finding the same shortcoming in that it's very difficult to know what the trends are like because there's so little data, there's so many gaps in terms of research and data in these fields that it becomes very difficult to look at trends for things like social equity and, um, and, gen and sort of gender equity and social justice. I just had a few questions, um, just because I, I remember a conversation I had about, uh, it was after watching some documentary that had to do with like the Barefoot School in India, mm -hmm. and um, it, was, it was placed around Jordan, and kind of like the issue of yeah. getting, uh, getting like Muslim women more uh, in, into renewable energy. Yeah. Um, and there was, <laughs> it was, <coughs> it was a kind of this one-on-one -on -one debate against like, uh, a very liberal like Muslim woman and this really yeah. <laughs> conservative Muslim yeah. man, and they were talking about how the kind of the government's priorities in, you know, I especially in Jordan, kind of prioritizing, you know, e equity versus we have all these unemployed engineers and all these yeah, unemployed yeah, yeah. people. Yeah. And I just wanted to know, like, what, what were your comments on kind of that, that contrast between, okay, yeah, equity is important, but my country is struggling and we have all these, like, lower, maybe lower hanging fruit that might be more productive or something like that. I mean, I hear so many shades of that argument, and I think generally, right? Like when you have a bigger, any kind of bigger, and by bigger, I, I mean like not more important, but say when you're during the time of the civil rights movement in the US, you know, when women said, you know, I think we have, black women said, we have issues that are actually quite different and that we need to address within our own communities, they were told to be quiet. So they said, don't be divisive, there's a much bigger battle at stake. So women, that happens all the time when women are often told that there are bigger issues that we have to sort of hold back and it'll not now later, right? But I do think it's important to bring these up issues before rather than later so that we can plan proactively for them. So, and in particular for, uh, I mean, I've looked, at, I, I've looked at a lot of the Barefoot College's work and I think, I mean, one of the big things, it, it has a very, um, um, what should I call him? Sort of a very personable um, person who heads it, Bunker Roy. Who, yeah, he's very, he's everywhere. You see him everywhere. He's very uh, socially active. You know, so the, it has that kind of a charismatic leader going for it. Um, on the ground, even barefoot has lots of issues that I think if you dug deeper, you would find quite easily. But they seem to have made, but they give their work so much publicity. Right? So you hear about them in everything, and you have the grandmothers who go from Jordan to India to train, and the African grandmothers going. Um, so yeah, it does create, it does cr definitely create new sources of affiliation for women and new forms of, uh, even if you don't call it in employment, income generation, I think, but 
the important thing is looking at it empirically on the ground and saying, how sustainable are these initiatives? What kinds of um, you know, other social protections do people have? And I think that's a conversation we can't move away from. I think that even to be innovative in terms of employment, people, we do need to extend like universal social protection floors. I think that's really important. And often I think we're told that just creating these often very unreliable and erratic forms of employment will somehow take the place of social protection, which I don't think it does, right? Thank you, Pasha. I really enjoyed your talk. I wanted to ask you, in the patterns that you observed, that you described across this expanding sector and, and the different employment opportunities, have you tried to look at how those patterns may or may not be different across rural and, and urban areas? Yeah, I think the skill shortages often, like gaps in research, gaps in skills, are more significant for rural areas. I think I mentioned that at one point, that we're finding, especially a lot of these initiatives, they really want to employ women, but in rural areas, they're having much, a much harder time finding women, just because levels of literacy are different, right? Levels of, you know, like business skills are different. So there, there's a type of training and capacity building that needs to be done in rural areas, whereas in urban areas, there are way more highly edu you know, educated and trained women. So there's the institutions that also provide the training are more accessible for women. Whereas in rural areas, I think definitely there's a much bigger gap. And the other question I was going to ask you, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the data collection that you're doing in yeah. China, Brazil, and India, and the project that you have. Gosh, it's all happened in such bits and pieces, you know? Like one, uh, India definitely I did on, like actually had a big research project with the Energy and Resources Institute, which has the project called Lighting a Billion Lives, and they do solar, basically. They, they use this model to... to um, basically provide solar access in all over the world, all over the country in many rural and kind of underserved communities as well. And then Sewa has been there for a long time, right? So they do have a, this project called the Hariali Green Energy Project. It's an IFC project. So that was easy for me because I know the institutions, I know the people, so I could go in there and say, let's start designing this research. Let's interview people. Let's interview p women who are part of these groups and find out what challenges they're facing. Um, China, obviously, I didn't have those connections. And this is before I actually knew that WR, maybe now I will, uh, has an office in China as well. So um, what I started out with and with China, all I did was knowledge synthesis of what existed in the English language, first of all. Whatever I could find, I collected. Like I went to the International Renewable Energy Net, uh, Agency, the IRENA website, and found whatever I could from them. And then I looked just generally in English, whatever would come up, basically I looked for it and synthesized that knowledge for China, right? Then what I did was, it was the same for Brazil. That's kind of what I've done until now. But we have, in Canada, we have this program called the METAX program. It's this. Um, it's a federal initiative where you can actually bring students over from other countries and you can send students as well. You can send Canadian students and you send them with an industry partner. So it's an industry partner and an academic advisor, that sort of a thing. So this summer, actually, I'm going to be getting two interns, one from Brazil and one from China, who is going to help me collect more of the data for China and, uh, and Brazil on this topic. But it's kind of a very, I call it my vacuum cleaner methodology because I take whatever I can find because it's so diffuse. The data is so diffuse and you have to look in so many different places to find, to even put together some kind of a picture of what's happening. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you had made the connection between your work and the sort of Marxist tradition of writing about um, post-petrol energy transition. Um, I don't know if you've come across Kolya Bramsky, Massimo De Angelis, uh, George Kafensis. So, because they write um, about the social struggles that arise as a result of the transition to a renewable world, and yeah. so they they look at. Um, within the petro sector, you know, what happens there as um, restructuring happens. Uh -huh. Also, the social struggles of sort of opposition to renewable projects when land is expropriated. Mm -hmm. And so they look at these kinds of things, and I actually think there's some really great connections, and I'd love to connect you up with Kolya, who's a friend and a former okay. colleague of mine. That would be awesome. There's, a, there's, there's one group in Canada called Petrocultures, 
and they look basically at the, I mean, they look at oil sands and they look at, you know, the, t the types of sort of practices and cultures that it breeds, right? So I have, look, whatever I do, I mean, I, I get the, like, I get the food versus fuel, I get, you know, the struggles for land. Those are hap unfolding everywhere. Like, there's the, a huge backlash against acquiring land for renewable energy projects, and sometimes understandably. I think, right? So yes, absolutely, I would love to connect with uh, the person who's working on that, absolutely.